Now we are rapidly approaching the end of the great book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, and the oldest complete work of literature that was ever written. We've discussed these matters very thoroughly in our introductory remarks on lessons number one and two. We're now in the concluding lesson to deal with the book of Job, the last two 30-minute lectures that deal with Job chapter 38 through Job chapter 42. In our last lesson, we learned that the Bible has some questions which it posed to scientists, which no scientist can answer. And in the monologue that follows, where the Lord is talking to Job without getting an answer one way or another from Job, in Job chapter 38 and Job chapter 39, the Lord calls Job's attention to the marvels that go on in the natural creation, whose creator was God. Notice in these passages in Job chapter 38 and 39, Job is asked questions about the goats, the hinds, the wild asses, the unicorn, the peacock, the ostrich, the horse, the grasshopper, the hawk, the eagle, the lion, the raven, and finally behemoth and leviathan, which clearly picture, incidentally, the Antichrist and the devil. But in all these passages, notice the remarkable reference to the natural creation, especially in Job chapter 39, verse 5, Job 39, 7, 39, 13, 39, 16, 39, 22, and the mass of material about the snow and the hail and the water and the frost and the constellations in Job chapter 38, verse 22, Job 38, verse 25, Job 38, verse 28, Job 38, verse 31, Job 38, verse 33, and 34. The great enemy of these biblical truths uh, turned out to be the teacher of evolution, Charles Darwin, who picked up what he knew from Charlie Lyle and some other deluded souls. And these fellows developed and thrusted upon the educated world the famous theory of evolution, which is a mad of pipe dreams you ever found at Disneyland Circus. The evidence we have listed, so-called vestigial structures, comparative anatomy, biochemistry, embryology, taxonomy, and geographic distribution. And of these things, it may be said briefly, and will be as brief as possible, because in a Bible study in the book of Job, we don't have time to refute thoroughly the theory of evolution, which has been refuted so many times. It's a wonder there's anybody left in America or Europe that even believe in it. But the truth of the matter is, the vestigial organs all have uses that have been found, or at least it cannot be proved they do not have uses. The matter of comparative anatomy, of course, is a joke. Many of the skulls they found turn out to be skulls of people in the last 200 years. Some of them turn out to be sure enough hoaxes. And the one they found that they profess to be a million years old go back into the age of the dinosaurs. And up until 10 years ago, it was a no-no to have men running around with dinosaurs. Science always changes its facts to meet the contemporary situation. Biochemistry, of course, is a hee-haw. Blood precipitation tests prove absolutely nothing. Embryology turned out to be a howl, as it turned out that when the embryo was coming up, the human embryo, it didn't go through the stages of the race at all, because the head was much too big for the size of the body. What they took to be gill slits in the unborn child turned out to be merely folds in the skin, and on and on and on. Now, the massive, uh, the, the voluminous compilation of literature on this subject is that done by Henry Morris and Harry Rimmer and Wilbur Smith, and of course there are many others. Suffice it to say that no man in his right mind could possibly be an evolutionist. He'd have to be about half crazy. Anybody who's gone through caring up keep on a car or caring up keep on a home or caring up keep on children knows what evolution is. It's a horse laugh. The idea of taxonomy proving something is a little bit too much because after all the uh, classification of the fossils and things they find, they arrange from the simple to complex to try to prove the theory and they grouped according to what they call, quote, fundamental similarities. Which simply means when some idiot starts out with the Cambrian period and comes up to the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic ages, and comes up through the Carboniferous period and, the, and all this, you know, you know the party line, he simply arranges the objects to suit himself. That's what it amounts to. And that's about all it amounts to. The evidence of organic evolution are supposed to be genetics and controlled breeding, Supposedly greyhounds and dachshunds, a Shetland pony and a draft horse are supposed to bring about evolution in a, quote, limited way. The evidence from the fossils is called undeniable proof in the textbooks. When the fossils have been arranged in chronological order, they commonly show a series of changes that are readily explainable as the product of organic evolution. The truth of the matter is there isn't a fossil or one living thing they ever found before the Precambrian period, before the Cambrian period, 
and the fossil evidence for the Precambrian period is zero. The mechanics of evolution are supposed to be, according to Darwin and the best educated brains of the day, variation, the struggle for existence, natural selection, heredity, and isolation. And of this Disneyland exegesis, we may say hee-haw with all due respect to those involved. The bigger the belfry, the more room for the bats. And like my maid told me one time, she said, if you ain't got no education, you just got to use your brains. The supposedly geological ages they set up in eras are supposed to be measured, first of all, by the salt content of the sea, supposed to be fresh water with soil washed away, by the deposition of sediments, by the rate of erosion, which isn't always consistent, and by the disintegration of radioactive material and mineral, specifically radioactive carbon-14. You know, the study of this, all this uh, man-made hocus-pocus and mumbo-jumbo begins with the Greek philosophers who got very upset about marine deposits and shells and rocks removed from seawater. Uh, Xenophanes uh, and the rest of them way back there before the, before the time of Christ, Herodotus and Empedocles and Aristotle all rejected the biblical account of the flood. They were negative on the gods to retain their social standing, and they thought the fish wandered inland through underground rivers. Leonardo da Vinci denied a universal flood and attacked the idea that it could have formed fossils. The whole trouble began when they began to find fish heads and fish skeletons on mountains. That's where the whole stink came from to start with that it was a rejection of the days of Noah. Nicholas Steno, 1638 to 1687, was the first to kid people into thinking that rock strata were deposited in normal succession so as to rule out a ca catastrophe like the flood. And, of course, those of us who studied such phenomena as uh, polystrate fossils have better sense to believe a cock and bull story like that. You can find scores of trees buried in four or five layers of sediment, which were supposed to be 150,000 years apart, and yet the trees have been preserved intact. Another very embarrassing thing that stands against evolution is the so-called uh, ossiferous fissures, where they find graveyards composed of bones of all kinds of animals, camels and rhinoceroses, or rhinoceri, together in Nebraska, with a man's bones, and how all the animals suddenly got together on high ground, all got buried together without fighting or killing each other, is a mystery past finding out. But it never bothered this bunch of characters. You can't explain it any way except that animals were running for their life to high ground when the flood came. And there are many other holes in the argument. The deposit of loess, the fine volcanic silt that lies around different parts of the earth at high altitudes, shows that it was deposited by water that was going out uh, through the bottom of a deep slack water out of a bathtub. We also find very embarrassing questions brought up about Darwin's theory in regard to erratic boulders, which glaciers were supposed to have moved, which they couldn't possibly have moved, they've gone over them. And there's always those embarrassing erratic boulders that have moved from the equator toward the North Pole. Exactly what glacier began in Mexico and Florida and moved up to Kansas is a little bit hard to say. So much for the monkey to man theory, or as one has so aptly put it, once I was a tadpole when I began to begin, and then I was a frog with my tail tucked in, next I was a monkey in a banyan tree, now I'm a doctor with a Ph.D., the question that, that Darwin couldn't answer and your college professor couldn't answer are the following. How do plunging birds attacking know that the fastest velocity cannot be attained by a perpendicular plunge due to the tilt of the earth on its axis and the consequent atmospheric motion and pressure? The arch of the cycloid by which they plunge was only known by two men in the 18th century. How did the birds find that out 150,000 B.C. according to evolutionists? Somebody said instinct. That isn't instinct. That's imparted wisdom. What about the female mackerel? It lays 500,000 eggs at one time. Ten years of progeny of every egg would fill the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean with fish to a depth of 32,000 feet solid. The herring for 20 years would equal the bulk of the globe, 338 trillion tons of herring, unless there wasn't a way to get rid of them. Who equipped the fish to divide H2O into one-third and utilize the oxygen through, oxygen through its gills? That principle is used in the laboratory now, but who taught the fish to do it? Who equipped to a fish to divide H2O into three parts and then get the oxygen out of it? Somebody said it's instinct. Why, it's nonsense. A man couldn't do it by experiment in a laboratory until the last 400 years. 
In Malaysian water, there's a fish with bifocal eyes. There are no internal combustion engines operated satisfactorily until a British physician took a French mechanic into a surgery and applied the principle of the heart valve to the gasoline motors. Now, how about the one who invented the principle? How come the fish knew about it? All cells in the body are renewed every 28 days. Who does this? Animals have no memory for anything abstract, yet men do. Who did that? There's no way to explain these things. These things coming up they keep calling instinct are nothing but imparted wisdom, and no animal in the world could have figured out how to do it. Nobody could have taught how the army ants how to go to the edge of the river and then ball up in a ball and roll across the river. You don't do that by experimentation. You do that by drowning. Explain it. The proportion of nitrogen and oxygen is consistent to 79 parts to 21 on the sea level on the mountaintops anywhere in the world. And if you change that proportion of 79 to 21 to nitrogen 2 and oxygen 2, you'd have nitric, nitric oxide, which is a gas, and it would choke and contract the glottis, and you'd all strangle. If the proportion of nitrogen and oxygen was 2 to, not to 1, like N2O, you'd have laughing gas. And if nitrogen was heavier than oxygen, which it's not, the whole earth would be covered with gas. It'd be a death trap. Who measured the gases? Why, NO2 is the nitro group. You add glycerin and sulfuric acid, you get nitroglycerin. And NO2 dissolved in water is nitric acid. How do you transport ocean water to the mountaintops? How do you get rid of the salt on the way up from the salt sea? Well, what if the... Uh, you got water weighing 800 times as much as the atmosphere, but you have vapor under the sun, one-eighth the weight of the atmosphere, and the sun is not hot enough to vaporize the salt so it stays, and the clouds lose the heat over the land and drop the water back, and there the Lord sends you your rain, and somebody said it's natural processes. You're crazy. You're out of your mind. If the freezing temperature were lowered, lowered 5% below where it is, you'd have rain falling on you and freezing as soon as it hits you. Why, if the earth was even 10% closer to the sun than it is, the whole earth would burn up in less than 24 hours, and if the earth were 10% further away from the sun than it is, there'd be a glacial cap around the whole world. Now, what's the explanation for these things? Well, modern science has no explanation at all. They just hit or miss or guess. And then every now and then they get against a terribly embarrassing problem like the whale. For surely as these animals came up and came up out of the water and began to develop hind legs and lose their tails, according to Darwin, why would one then turn around and go back into the water and have his tail left to him, like a whale or a porpoise? And it's very embarrassing, old boy, and all that sort of rot, don't you know, when you consider the fact that the whale and the porpoise are mammals. They give suck to their young. The rest of the fish lay eggs. Tell me something. Who was the first whale that learned how to suckle its young without the young drowning? A mammal is an air breather. If you kept a porpoise on the water indefinitely, he drowned. Now, there's so many of these questions that it would take another full-length book to even discuss them, and the short commentary in the book of Job, we're not going to have time to go into these things. We're going to close the account by simply saying that when God appears to Job in Job chapter 38 and 39 and 40 and 41, he puts questions to him that Darwin never even approached and didn't dare approach. And there's no answer for these matters. There isn't one man, I say, without embarrassment or blushing. There isn't one man, living or dead, who could ever prove evolution was anything more than a cock and bull story. And the people who want to believe it have a religious hallucination, and the reason why they want to believe it, as a man said, is because it's the result of the brilliant speculation of pagan imagination. Man likes to think he's going up instead of down, and that's why he espouses the ridiculous, stupid theory. Taught by A. Wolf, John Astrick, Royce, Erasmus Darwin, William Paley, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, Robert Chambers, Spencer, Rousseau, Darwin, Haeckel, Rousseau, Hobbes, Voltaire, Lessing, Schiller, Carlyle, James, Nietzsche, Tom Paine, Kant, Strauss, Schleiermark, Richard Huxley, Schopenhauer, and the rest of the curriculum you're going to finish out this year. The fruits of evolution are the survival of the first. Every communist in the world is an evolutionist. You can't be a communist without being an evolutionist. Evolution is the religion of the Communist Party. Every communist is an idolater and he's a religious fanatic. 
and his religion is based on the theory that if you take the thesis and the antithesis and put them together by revolution, you get the synthesis, and this is progress. This means every communist is a religious fanatic, and his religion is evolution. You can't be a communist without being an evolutionist, albeit you might be an evolutionist without being a communist. Now we have this great book in illustrations from nature here in Job chapter 38 and Job chapter 39 where the Lord puts it to Job in no uncertain terms and he can't answer. There's no answer to it. On he goes and in Job chapter 40 Job finally answers. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. The Bible says when the world stand before God, the whole world shall be guilty, and every mouth stopped. And this is where Job finds himself. Accosted by the Godhead, he can't answer. Then answered the Lord to Job out of the whirlwind, and said, Verse 7, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. That's what he wanted. He'd been praying for a chance to do it. Now here's your chance, Job. And then the Lord lowers the boom. Verse 8. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? You see, Job's problem is clearly and plainly self-righteousness. He said, My integrity hold fast. And he said, I'll not let it go. And he said, My righteous I hold fast and will not let it go. My integrity I'll not remove from me. So plainly Job has pitted his righteousness against the righteousness of God. And the Lord says, Wilt thou disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Now I hope that the people listening to this uh, study are saved people. But if you're not, do you know what your trouble is? We talk about saving lost. I think sometimes people get the funny idea we're talking about being saved as kind of adjusting your personality so you can make a living and get your family back together again. That is what we're talking about. A saved man is a man who's trusting the righteousness of God to save him. Now, if you're not saved, you know what you're doing? I mean, in essence. I mean, according to the revelation of God without me positing an opinion one way or another. You are pitting your righteousness against God's righteousness. There isn't a man or woman listening to my voice who's counting on the religion to save them, who isn't in competition with God for righteousness. Who do you think is going to win, you or the Lord? The Lord came down here and lived a perfect life as a man like you and died a death like you'll die. And he said, that's the perfect life, that's my righteousness, that's the fulfillment of the law. If you want to get to heaven, trust that. And what are you doing? Why, you're, you're trying to tell God, I believe if I follow the teachings of Christ or the Ten Commandments, I'll be as good as you. You can't possibly. If you lived a sinless life from this day to the day you died, You'd still have a backlog of sin that would sink a flat top. You can't outdo God when it comes to righteousness. You said, I never thought I could, Brother Ruckman. You must think so, or you would have trusted Jesus Christ to save you a long time ago. You're lost. Cut the deck. Lay down the cards face up. A lost man is a man who's counting on his own righteousness to justify him before God. And that would include 90% of the lawyers and bankers and doctors in your town. Then the Lord says to Job, let's see how righteous you are, Job. Verse 9, hast thou an arm like God? Or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Put on the aurora borealis, Job. Put on an evening sunset. My, what a thing to say to a victim of leprosy sitting on an ash heap. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold every one that is proud, and abase him. Putting on a show isn't enough, Job. It is enough to put on the sunsets. It is enough to put on the sunrise. It is enough to put on the aurora borealis and the thunderhead and the clouds. It is enough to put on the pea-green 
ocean of the South Sea and and underline it with purple coral. It isn't enough, Job, to put the rainbow over the poly at the pass in Oahu. It isn't enough, Job. It isn't enough if you could do it. It wouldn't be enough, Job, to deck the mountains with gardens of forests and trees 60 and 70 feet high with wildflowers growing in every place. It isn't enough, Job. Also, Job, find everybody that's proud and knock them down, Job. Verse 12, look on everyone that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then, if you can do that, then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. Well, it's obvious he can't do it. So it's obvious you can't save yourself. Right hand or no? Sam Levinson said his father said, Son, there's one place you can always find a helping hand, and that's at the end of your right arm. But your right arm and your right hand can't save you now. Not up against God's righteousness. And the Lord gives Job two final revelations. These revelations have been changed in every new translation in the market. These two animals are called the behemoth in Job chapter 40, verse 15, and they're called Leviathan in Job chapter 41, verse 1. The new Bibles call these two animals the elephant or the crocodile or the hippopotamus, and you couldn't find a hippopotamus or a crocodile or whale within 30 verses of either chapter. What you have in Job chapter 40, verse 15, is a description of the Antichrist, and in Job chapter 41, the greatest, most complete, detailed description of Satan found anywhere in either testament. Don't you know the devil who is exposed by this book would be interested in knocking you out of Job 41 so you couldn't find the revelation? So in the margin of your Bible you find it's a whale or a whirlpool or a crocodile. Now, this is what happens to the silly idiots who spend all their time studying in Hebrew and Greek and think they're smart enough to correct the Word of God and then get upset about Brother Ruckman's language. This is so typical of these people. So typical of these people who think that 22 years of education equips them to correct the Word of God. It's very typical. These people bang around and mess around with trying to change the Word of God here and change it there with all this blather about the oldest manuscripts and the most ancient manuscripts and the mistakes of the King James translators and the original verbally inspired plenary blah, blah, blahs. And when they hit the truth right in the face, they can no more find it than a blind man in a cool cellar at two o'clock in the morning. They couldn't find a bowling ball in a bathtub. Do you realize Leviathan has more than one head? According to Psalm 74, verse 14. Did you ever see a crocodile with more than one head? Do you realize that Leviathan is called a dragon and a serpent in Isaiah 27, verse 1? Do you realize the dragon and the serpent are called the devil in Revelation chapter 12? Do you realize this passage of Leviathan, that this Leviathan is said to be king over all the children of pride, verse 34? That he doesn't fear God, verse 33? Now why would you think that was a crocodile? I've seen men who weren't afraid to jump into a pool and wrestle with a crocodile. While this being here, not only doesn't fear man, he doesn't fear God. Did you ever see a crocodile that breathed fire, verse 19? Did you ever see a whale that breathed sparks, verse 20 and verse 21? Now this is the lengths to which conservative scholarship will go to get rid of the authority of the Word of God. In order to maintain their standing image and be recognized recognized scholars, these silly clowns have perverted the entire Bible in order to establish their own authority and make you think they were smart when they were blind as a bat coming in backwards. There's no such thing as a Leviathan in the Bible apart from what the Bible says Leviathan is and the Scriptures define him. Psalm 74 verse 14 Isaiah 27, verse 1, Revelation chapter 12, verse 4 to verse 10. Now the word behemoth means animals, chapter 40, verse 15. And in spite of the fact that Kyle and Delich and Jacinius wrote Hebrew grammars and Harkavy and Hebrew lexicons, with a knowledge of Hebrew, they could not even find the cross-references that dealt with the material. This is due to the blind, blithering, bungling, stumbling, egotistical nonsense that's carried on by men who profess to believe the Bible while they're exalting themselves at the final authority above the Word of God. 
And these blind, blundering, blithering, stumbling leaders of the blind will tell you that behemoth is a crocodile or a whale or an elephant, and yet you're told the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 13 as a unit is a multiple animal, a lion, a bear, and a leopard. The Antichrist lacking an animal is called the same thing in Daniel chapter 7, where after giving the reader the preview of the lion kingdom, the bear kingdom, and the leopard kingdom, a fourth beast arises, which is a composite of all three beasts. This is what the word behemoth means in Hebrew, beasts in the plural. And if you should startle some of you people, don't forget Jesus Christ is called a lamb, one beast, a serpent on a pole, John 3, another beast, and the lion of the tribe of Judah, another beast. Where the Bible gives the truth, and 100% of the fundamental scholars say the opposite, you may throw them in the waste can. Don't take their remarks seriously. All right, in Job chapter 40, we read a description of the Antichrist, beginning at verse 15, likened to an animal called behemoth, or beast. Notice this animal's strength is in his belly, verse 16. This belly is white. In Revelation 13, a picture of Japheth, while the animal is yellow-brown, a picture of Shem with black spots all over him like ham. He has strong pieces of brass for bones. His bones are like bars of iron, verse 18. So only the word of God can divide asunder between the joints and marrow of those bones, Hebrews 4, verse 12, which was to be taken literally, not figuratively. And finally, to identify this monster, we read in Job 40, verse 19, he is the chief of the ways of God, and he, God, that made him, the Antichrist, can make his sword, Hebrews 4.12, approach unto him. On our next and final lesson, we'll take up some more remarks about this beast found in Job chapter 40 and discuss in greater detail the picture given us of Satan or Lucifer in Job chapter 41, which contains more material on the devil than any other two chapters in the entire Word of God. Now, we have said, as we have said in our introductory remarks and preparatory remarks, the book of Job, placed where it is, pictures clearly the great tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. And if you want to review these remarks, you may obtain the first two lessons on the book of Job, which deal with our introduction, where you notice that Esther, the book preceding it, pictures the marriage of the Lamb in heaven, the restoration of Israel. The book following it, Psalm, it presents the Messiah, the son of David. And in the book of Job, we find Job on the ground seven days and seven nights, matching each year of the tribulation, 42 chapters in the book, matching the three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, the last three and a half, and sure enough, at the end of the book, Job is restored as Israel will be restored, and gets his children back as there will be a resurrection at the end of the tribulation. It is not then unusual or passing strain that we should find the clearest picture of Satan in the Bible found in the book of Job. Job chapter 41, where he is pictured on the head of an animal called Leviathan. Of this animal, the whale is a type, from Psalm 104, verse 26. The typology should be very clear to the devout student of the Bible when he reads the book of Jonah, and remembers that a fish or a whale is never a type of Christ, but a type of the devil. The little ichthyus sitting around, the little fish marks, the modern Christian is a charismatic wipeout. It has nothing to do with the truth. Now, Leviathan here in the past is presented in his full glory, and I suppose of all the commentators and exegetes, Martin Luther was the only one that grasped the content of the passage when he wrote, On earth is not his equal, quoting Job chapter 41, verse 33, in saying, For still our ancient foe doth seek us to work us woe, his strength and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth he is not his equal. Job 41 had nothing to do with the crocodile, in spite of the New Schofield Reference Bible, or a whale, or a whirlpool, or a hippopotamus, or anything as stupid and silly as presented by the so-called recognized scholars. It is plainly His Majesty the Devil. Verse 1, He's aquatic, but you can't catch him with a hook. Verse 8, once you've been around with him, it's enough to remember the battle without getting back into it again. Verse 9, he has no hope because he's headed for hell. Verse 9, if God opened your eyes, you could see him, you'd faint. 
Verse 10, you don't dare stir him up, and you're a fool if you try it. Verse 10, God made him. Verse 11, the Lord said, I'll reveal him. Verse 12, the Lord said, I will reveal him. And here comes the revelation. Verse 15, although he was a cherub, he's now a serpent. He's pictured as a dragon with scales. Verse 15, just like a red Chinese dragon. And the mythological monsters have been raised up by legend and mythology. So you'd not believe the biblical account when you got to it. He breathes fire, verse 19, 20, and 21, and if you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do, you will smoke. For out of his mouth go burning lamps, sparks of fire leap out, verse 20, out of his nostrils go of smoke, and 21, when he inhales, it kindles the coal. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. There's where the American Indian got that smoke pipe from, that peace pipe. He said the thing that the Gentiles worship, they worship devils. You cannot have fellowship with the Lord and fellowship with devils. He's pictured as an aquatic animal, and as it stands, verse 31, he goes up and down through the great deep. The great deep in verse 31 has no reference to the Atlantic or to the Pacific. The great deep in verse 31 is clearly a reference to the deep of Genesis 1, verse 2, and this deep is said to be above the universe, water above and water below, and this is the sea, of which it is said there shall be no more sea in the new heavens and new earth, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Upon earth there is not his like, verse 33, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He's not a whale or a hippopotamus stuck down on the brink. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride, Job. And there the Lord finishes talking to Job. And the last thing he tells Job is, Job, you know who your daddy is? Well, if you're trusting your daddy, if you're trusting your righteousness, your daddy is the devil. He is a king over all the children of pride. And that finishes Job. And Job says in chapter 42, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered things that I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. He's going to answer. Good man, worth more money. He said, I'd answer God. He's going to answer. Of course, he's not going to answer the way he said he was going to answer, but he'll answer. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself. There's the mark of conversion and repentance. Wherefore I abhor myself. He no longer has a very high estimation of himself. On the 14th of March, 1949, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, and I must confess that since that day I've had a better opinion of every uh, pimp and junkie and prostitute and hustler and kidnapper and bank robber and murderer I've ever heard of since that day. Once you see yourself as God sees you, it's amazing how your opinion change about things. And Job says, Once I have seen you, I abhor myself, and I repent in sackcloth and ashes, in dust and ashes. Dust and ashes. Now this brings about the revelation that Job knew nothing about. When we first began this book 41 chapters ago, we read about a scene in heaven, in the chancery of heaven, where Satan appeared in the corridors of justice, and got permission from God to put Job through the mill. Here at the end of the book, the Lord reveals Satan to Job, and Job at last sees who his adversary is. His adversary was not the Lord. How unfortunate it is that nobody in the Schoolfield Reference Board of the Lockman Foundation ever got the revelation. Although Job found it 1,800 years before Christ was born, and more than 25 centuries before these idiots began to mess with the Bible text. Satan is revealed to Job, not only in his essential personality as a dragon, a fallen cherub, although he appears an angel of light, but as a man to show up on this earth someday an antichrist who's likened to a multiple beast, behemoth, in the passage. And when Job receives this revelation, he repents in dust and ashes and goes back to what he says and has a change of heart and change of mind. Did you notice everybody at the end of this book changes except God? I mean, in verse 7, chapter 42, 7, 
the Lord spoke these words to Eliphaz the Temanite, and said, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken to me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Well, he just claimed that Job hadn't spoken right. When he appeared to Job, he said in Job chapter 40, verse 6 to 7, You didn't speak right. And when he appeared to Job over here in Job chapter 38, verse 2 to 4, he said, Who is he that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? But in Job chapter 42, verse 7, he said, You have not spoken me of the, me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. So Job did speak the thing that was right. The thing that he spoke that was right was, I repent in dust and ashes. Did you notice how his three, three friends never opened their mouths? I mean, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite never opened their mouth. Why, way back in Job chapter 7, verse 20, Job said, I have sinned. And in Job 42, 6, he said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And his three buddies didn't say that. So the Lord now says to these three characters, Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and so far the name of Thite went, and did according to the Lord commanded them, as the Lord commanded them, the Lord also accepted Job. So the Lord accepted Job, and then he accepted uh, Job's intercession for his friends. Job shall pray for you. And when he, as a man said one time, when Job got praying for his friends, then the Lord restored him and got everything back. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Beautiful for spiritual application, but even more beautiful doctrinal application. In Deuteronomy 21, 17, Deuteronomy 21, 17, and Psalm 14, 7, and Psalm 53, 6, and Psalm 85, 1, and Psalm 126, 1, the expression, turn the captivity, always refers to the restoration of Israel at the end of Daniel's 70th week. Therefore, the book ends right on the money and right on the note without a hitch in it. It ends in 42 chapters, one for each month in the Great Tribulation, after seven days and seven nights, picturing seven years of tribulation, where Satan has been persecuting Job, as Satan will persecute Israel in the tribulation, and it end with the restoration of Job, as it will end with the restoration of Israel, and here comes a resurrection of his dead children. Verse 13, he also had seven sons and three daughters, the identical number he had before. Pick up the commentaries, and you'll find them trying everywhere in the world to get rid of that resurrection from the end of Job. Especially the Living Bible has changed the verses all around to make you think that these are seven different sons and three different daughters. And by doing this, Kenneth Taylor has erased one of the greatest truths in either testament. The fact that there is a post-tribulation rapture of tribulation saints and a resurrection of Israel, Ezekiel 37 and 38, immediately preceding the millennium. And this obliteration and perversion of Bible truth, and this falsifying of true doctrine, this blasphemous apostasy that's going on in America today, is carried out by every major commentator on the book of Job. You will do well to disregard it and accept the text at face value. Verse 12, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a 1,000 yoke of oxen and a 1,000 she-asses. If you compare this with Job chapter 1, verse 3, you'll find this man had double, had double the possessions that he had to start with. And so the book ends happily as a book ought to end. After all, there's something deep within human nature inside us that tells us that in the end it has to work out all right, or there isn't a God above. There's something very unsatisfactory about a movie or a book that ends on a sour note. There's something very disheartening about a book or a movie that ends on a tragic note without the problem being solved. It may be interesting. It may be a fascinating novel to read. But something in us insists the book should work out right, and when it doesn't, we're deeply disappointed. And that's why 100,000 television shows every three years have to end with the heroine and the hero happy and the villain in jail or killed or something else. 
because there's something persistent in human nature that tells us if there's any God above, in the end it will work out all right. In the book of James, we read where the, uh, James said, You have heard of the patience of Job. You have seen the end of the Lord, how he is pitiful and full of tender mercies. And the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And so all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who the call according to his purpose. And Job's present light affliction, which was but for a moment, worked a far more exceeding weight of glory for him, while he looked at the things that were not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And we read in conclusion, verse 16, After this lived Job a hundred and forty years, and saw his sons, and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died, being old and full of days. This is the oldest man you've read about so far since Jacob, who lived to be 147. And if Job was 50 years old in chapter 1, he lived to be 190. If he was 70 years old in chapter 1, he lived to be 200 years old. And this remarkable age span of 190 to 200 defines and locates clearly, once and for all, finally and forever, the time of the writing of the book of Job. The book of Job was written by Elihu, a contemporary of Job, and it had to be written during the patriarchal age when Jacob lived to be 147. It could not possibly have taken place as late as the time of Moses. Therefore we say and say justly and properly, the book of Job is by far away and away the oldest book in the Bible written long before Genesis, and as far as that goes, the first literary masterpiece the world ever saw. So quite naturally it deals with the main problem of mankind. Why do the righteous suffer? Now we're through with the book of Job. I realize these lessons have been very brief and very short. We've only skimmed the surface in the book of Job, and there should be much more time to go over these matters in detail, especially the terrific matters that deal with the Antichrist in chapter 40 and Leviathan in chapter 41. But we'll close the account with one or two brief remarks about the attempts of conservative scholarship to overthrow the authority of the book. The most satanic perverse of these efforts was carried out by the revivers of the New American Standard Version and the American Standard Version and the International Bible, who used the Vatican and Sinaiticus manuscript for their translation of the New Testament. This is what they call the LXX, and it contains the Old Testament in Greek. At the end of the book of Job, in the LXX, the corrupt manuscripts used by the Lockman Foundation, you will find 15 words added to the text. Fifteen words. And yet when these new revisions and new Bibles come out, they are afraid to tell you what the words are. So this is the work of the utmost duplicity. The new Bibles also have attacked the Leviathan in chapter 41 and tried to convert him into an ordinary animal, which of course he's not. Again, the new Bibles have attacked the doctrine of the physical resurrection in Job chapter 19. You can hardly find a new Bible in the market that doesn't take a slap at Job chapter 19, verse 25, to get rid of the physical resurrection. And there are many other places in this book where the truths of the Word of God have been attacked by conservative and fundamental scholars, as well as by the liberals, the orthodox, the new orthodox, and the neo-evangelicals. The serious student of the Word of God should adopt the same practice in each one of these cases. He should believe what God said as God said it. And what God has given here has been given in the universal language of the end time, English, and preserved without proven error by the Holy Spirit who used this book to bless more people and save more people in the Philadelphia church period than any other 30,000 translations of the Bible combined. After all, we must remember that it was the Philadelphia church period that kept the word of God, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8, not the church of, the, of Ephesus. The people who wrote the original manuscripts, that church, the original verbally inspired manuscripts, did not keep the word. And the Lord said of that bunch, you've left your first love. But when the Lord got to the Philadelphia church period, he said, you've kept my word. And it was the only church that God had no rebuke for among the seven church periods mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Aside from this, one can get great spiritual blessings from the book of Job, even if one is not able to comprehend all the doctrines in it. And I would suggest, in line with reading the book of Job, a reading of the con concentration camp literature of Germany about the inmates of Treblinka and Bells and Bells and Buchenwald and Auschwitz. I would also recommend the work by Holland Popoff, on his 13 years of confinement by the communists, 
and the very excellent work by Richard Wormbrandt called Stronger Than Prison Walls. In all of these terrible accounts, also perhaps Fox's Book of Martyrs may be included in the bibliography, in all these horrible and terrible accounts of suffering and privation and starvation and pain and torture and persecution to the point of madness, one finds the great theme of Job is as contemporary as the day it was written. The book of Job is perennial. It'll never get out of date. As long as there's suffering, death, pain, sorrow, affliction, and heartache on this earth, the book of Job will still be the crowning work of literature, the capstone of man's literary ability to solve the problem of why do the righteous suffer. Our book has taught us several great lessons. They who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And although Job was not in Christ Jesus, his life exemplifies this New Testament teaching. Secondly, God uses Satan to glorify himself. We cannot understand all the operations of the unseen and visible spiritual world, but the Lord maketh no mistake. The Bible says God will make the wrath of men to, repra- to praise him, and he'll restrain the remnant of the wrath. God will use the devil for his own purposes. Thirdly, we learn that the best men are sinners. Job was undoubtedly one of the best men that ever lived. I suppose perhaps the most righteous man in the entire Old Testament. As we remarked at the beginning of our uh, discourse in the book of Job, uh, the three men in the Old Testament who were held up by the Holy Spirit himself as being outstanding men of righteousness, the Lord picked Noah, Job, and Daniel. But even Job had his faults. It is true Job could not be caught in the overt act of any sin outwardly, but his sin was a secret pride and a secret confidence in his own righteousness. If all of us has a little sin as Job had, we'd certainly be fine Christian people. But even with the little sin he had, he had the king crowning sin of them all. He had pride. And pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. I wouldn't dare throw a stone at Job. I let somebody else cast the rock. But I must go by the words of Scripture. When the Lord rebuked Job, he rebuked him for his self-righteousness. Then we learn that there are some things that cannot be explained apart from biblical revelation. There are some things you cannot explain by looking around at nature. And the silly, superficial people that talk about God being revealed in nature only, and knowing all they need to know about God by observing nature, are kidding nobody but themselves. You can't look at nature and realize that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. You can't look at nature and realize that it would take a blood atonement to cleanse you from your sins. You cannot look at nature and find anything that when it's reborn and experiences regeneration is cut loose from its flesh and placed into the body of the Godhead. There are certain things you can look at nature to your deaf, dumb, and blind, and you'll never learn about God apart from a special revelation. This was the great stumbling of the Deists in the 17th and 18th century that came out of England and infected and polluted the religious life of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and other Deists. And these people got the funny idea that if they just love folks and try to help folks out and believe in God, they'd be all right. The devils believe in God and tremble, says James. There are some things that are only explainable from special revelation. We learned also that only one sin will damn a man. Whatever sins a man may commit, the one sin that will damn him is the sin of self-righteousness. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ then the law of righteousness to everyone that believeth. And finally, we learn from this great and blessed book that God is loving and merciful to any sinner who forsakes his own righteousness. And Job finally forsook his own righteousness, and my, how the Lord blessed him. Did you notice way back there in chapter 5, when all this terrible drama began, that Eliphaz the Temanite gave a prophecy which he didn't realize would even take place and come to pass, and yet in Job's case it came to pass? When Eliphaz opened his mouth and began a discourse on God's judgments and punishments against the wicked and his blessings upon the righteous, little did Eliphaz realize that he was talking about Job in the end. Here's what Eliphaz said, and with this we shall conclude. Job 5, verse 17. Job 5, verse 17. Behold, 
Happy is the man whom God correcteth. That's Job. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. And do you realize, my beloved, that those are the words that are quoted in the book of Hebrews to the New Testament Christians? For he maketh sore, that's Job, and bindeth up, that's Job. He woundeth, and his hands make whole, that's Job. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven, there shall no evil touch thee. That was Job. In famine he shall redeem thee from death. He did. In war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. And Job did at the end of his life. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. For thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field. There's the millennium. And the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee. There's the lion eating straw like an ox. There's the bear and the kid and the calf and the leopard lying down together. And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and it was, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and glory to God, quote, shall not sin. Sinless perfection is the end of the saint. Someday we'll be up there in glory with Jesus Christ, conformed to his image, and fulfilling the great decree that said, For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Someday we'll be through with sin and sorrow and pain forever. And like the book says in that glorious city, No pain, no death, no tears. God shall wipe away all tears in their eyes. No pain, no death, no sorrow, no affliction. We'll gladly wait for our pie in the sky by and by. And we have nothing but pity or contempt for the religious leaders and political leaders who are trying to drag heaven down to earth and make this earth a heaven to live upon when it's going to be hell on earth till Jesus Christ comes back. If it weren't so tragic, it'd almost be funny. They want their pie on the earth now and now. There isn't any such thing known in the history of man. The future is wars and rumors of wars with three world wars in the near future. The first one is mentioned in Revelation chapter 6. The second one is mentioned in the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, and the Battle of Gog and Magog in Revelation chapter 20. With three world wars in the future, why look for pie on the earth now and now? You'd better get it in the sky by and by. Or that song says in the sweet by and by we meet on that beautiful shore. That'll be the time. And there, you and I, and Daniel, and Noah, and Job won't have to worry about sin anymore, won't have to worry about temptation anymore. We'll be up there with the tabernacle of God as with men, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and they shall see him. We'll be in that city where they have no need of the sun to shine by day, or the moon by night, and as the book says, we'll reign with him forever and ever. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and considered the end of the Lord. That is how God dealt with him in the end. How the Lord is full of mercy, and tenderness, and goodness. And thus you'll find it to be. And O oh, sorrowing saint, in the throes of tribulation, and the fires of God's refinement and suffering, or under the hand of God's chastening and scourging, all I can tell you is what the book says. My God shall supply all your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He hath said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. May God Almighty in the hour of our bereavement and sorrow and affliction and distress and torment grant us a sense of his presence, and a sense of his power, and the comfort of his Holy Spirit, that we might be able to come overcome all temptation to groan and complain and murmur, and come out victorious, come through like pure gold, tried in the fire, with nothing but praise for God, as that great old saint who said, What? We receive good at the hand of God. Shall we not also receive evil? The Lord hath taken, the, the Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen.
and amen.